Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third College Readiness webinar sponsored by UW System and the Wisconsin Department for Public Instruction. Today, we're going to be talking about college readiness for English, uh, but before we begin, please be sure to mute your sound. Uh, we are recording this webinar for placement up on the website for people to view at a later date, and we want to avoid it as much noise distraction as possible. Uh, if at any time during the webinar you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. We do have someone here moderating the webinar, so if you're having technical difficulties, you can type those questions into the chat box and she will be able to try to help you troubleshoot them. Uh, and if you have questions regarding the content that is being delivered, you can also type those into the chat box and we will, should have some time for questions at the end of the webinar. So we have, um, uh, one moment, please, we have some, tech oh, there we go, the slide, I didn't think the slides were advancing, sorry. Uh, so we are joined today by four uh, wonderful faculty who will be talking about college readiness in English. So today we have with us Virginia Crank from UW La Crosse, Wade Mahon from UW Stevens Point, Karen McClear from UW Platteville, and Siobhan Watson from UW Milwaukee. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to them. And uh, without further ado, I believe we'll hear from Virginia next. Great. Students entering college English courses can expect to encounter a wide variety of courses. So we can't say a lot today about the specific numbers and types of papers they'll write or which particular texts they're likely to read. Um, college writing, writing doesn't operate from a shared curriculum or set of texts. What we can do today is describe what we've learned from our combined experiences as first-year writing teachers and scholars about what some of the general skills and approaches to English first-year college students are most likely to encounter. So the first slide you're seeing here is a summary of the frameworks for success in post-secondary writing. This document was written by the Council of Writing Program Administrators, the National Council of Teachers of English, and the National Writing Project. These are all national groups of writing teachers and scholars. And this document represents the culmination of years of research on writing and writing pedagogy. So rather than focusing on skills or bodies of content knowledge, this document lays out the eight habits of mind that have been found to be most likely to predict success in writing for college. I'd like to call special attention to a few of these habits of mind as they reveal a level of personal freedom and responsibility that might be new to some first-year college students. Curiosity and openness, creativity and flexibility all show that students need to be ready to do new things in college writing to stretch themselves and be ready to set aside habits they may have learned in high school in order to understand writing in new ways, ways that may make them uncomfortable or challenge their sense of their own writing abilities. In these challenges, we see the need for habits of mind like persistence and responsibility, the ability to push through difficulties and insecurities, to be willing to try and not succeed many times before trying and succeeding. The underlying habit of mind to all these others is metacognition. That's the ability to think about your own thinking, to examine your practices and processes in order to understand how they're developing and how you might need to adjust in order to grow. This habit of mind also includes developing an awareness of the social and contextual nature of communication, how every choice we make as writers is or should be influenced by who else reads and writes and when and where we read and write. So metacognition or self-reflection then feeds back into flexibility, openness, responsibility, et cetera. These habits of eight habits of mind all work in concert with one another to set the stage for growth and success in writing during all of college, not just first year writing or English classes. Okay, this is uh, Siobhan Watson from UW Milwaukee. Um, I, we want to turn to um, another uh, large professional uh, 
guiding document that's used by most, if not all, first year writing programs around the country, which is what's called the uh, WPA Outcomes Statement for First Year Composition. And this, too, uh, was created by the Council of Writing Program Administrators and is uh, widely available on the web. So these outcomes are goals, uh, broadly shared curricular uh, and learning goals for, um, for all writing programs, and they are um, end of year um, outcomes for first year students. But despite that fact, we feel that this is still, um, they still provide some nice guidance for discussion to um, explore the kinds of writing that students uh, will um, experience in the first year course. The four main areas um, is what will, um, of the WPA outcomes document, is what will organize the rest of our uh, discussion and presentation. These four areas are rhetorical knowledge, which I will discuss first, then critical thinking, reading, and composing, third, processes, and fourth, knowledge of conventions. So in terms of uh, rhetorical knowledge, um, I talk a lot with uh, high school uh, teachers, and we all work in various ways to create articulation between uh, uh, high school and college. And I have found the term of rhetorical dexterity to be uh, very helpful in doing this. So rhetorical dexterity is the ability to read, write, and function effectively within a broad array of rhetorical situations, both in and outside of school-based contexts. So rhetorical dexterity doesn't just focus only on school-based writing, but really uh, tries to help uh, students understand the variety of writing situations that they will also face in their professional and career lives as well. Rhetorical dexterity tries to get at, um, similar to what Virginia was talking about in terms of meta-level awareness, a sort of self-awareness, rhetorical dexterity tries to teach students um, a meta-level understanding of communication contexts very broadly and to understand that different communication contexts have different needs and demands that are placed on writers or speakers. I like to talk with uh, teachers about rhetorical dexterity in the sense of, of this next bullet, which is uh, I think one of the most important things that we can talk with students about is to anticipate variety, to expect the unexpected, uh, if you will, that uh, a, a stance, um, an attitude, an ability of rhetorical dexterity allows a student to know that variety and unexpected things in terms of what they'll learn of, um, in writing is, is coming in, in the first year course and in college more generally. Another concept that rhetorical dexterity tries to get at is to help students understand that they are never done learning to write and that new situations will always involve um, what to them probably feels like unlearning or relearning things and um, shifting um, away from a rules-based um, view of writing to something that's much more sort of facile um, and contextual. And I like to think of rhetorical dexterity as, as a skill, but also um, very much a sort of a mindset, an attitude, a kind of ready stance, um, if you will, for the variety to come. So what does this mean? So then we can talk about rhetorical dexterity in a variety of ways. So we can think about rhetorical dexterity for reading, for researching, and for writing. And so what this might mean in terms of reading, um, to have rhetorical awareness, to have a kind of savviness, is having exposure to a wide range of nonfiction texts and having exposure to very difficult texts and to complex arguments. That is what students um, read for the most part in first year courses and a lot of what they struggle with in terms of reading in the first year course. 
Um, another concept around reading is to help students shift in their thinking when they are trying to understand what they read from what happened, more of maybe a plot summary approach, to thinking what is the author trying to do with this text. Um, so that's a sort of a, a shift there that can be very helpful um, for students in navigating first year writing. And again, just giving students ranges of experiences with tracking long and complex arguments um, that, that evolve over a lengthy text. Rhetorical dexterity for researching um, means things like um, having exposure to a wide range of source types understanding that credibility is very contextual and dependent on a lot of factors, not only on where they got that information off of the web or through a database. Um, it also pertains to um, the ability to make individual and informed uh, decisions as they're working through their research and making decisions about sources perhaps even having them create a kind of defense or a rationale for why these sources fit their context, their audience, their purpose, their genre. Um, and as much as we're able um, trying to shift from a real prescribed and constrained set of linear processes that drive research to what's really a more kind of messy process, which we know is, is much more difficult to oversee and to teach, but is much more what they will uh, face um, in, in college more generally, is, is a much more recursive uh, research process, one in which they get much less um, sort of directives about where to go and, and what to do in terms of research. And finally, rhetorical dexterity for writing uh, means things like shifting uh, discussions from correctness to uh, discussions of credibility. So um, in the first year courses, we typically try to talk about issues of grammar and mechanics and other uh, knowledge of conventions, which my colleague will talk about, to um, talking uh, not about rules per se, but about how conventions and their control of those conventions impact their sense of credibility, their, um, their reader's sense of, of the author's um, credibility and authority. Um, it's rhetorical dexterity often also refers to, um, yes, we teach forms, we teach modes, we teach genres, we teach writing situations, and those kinds of templates, if you will, are very productive and heuristic for students. But as they move into, into college, they need to understand that they can't transfer those forms in a specific, discrete, one-to-one -one way. They won't go and write in those exact same same ways in college. So rhetorical dexterity in this way means, okay, I know how to do this thing. I, I can see the template. I can see the form. I, I understand what this genre is. But being able to draw on that knowledge and then being able to use it in a variety of ways um, in college uh, writing situations, that there will inevitably be variability um, across those modes or genres that they learn in high school. And finally, uh, rhetorical dexterity means shifting from a, a real linear set of processes and, and requirements to the extent that we can to facilitate more sort of organic learning that happens um, in the act of writing. So what that means is um, perhaps not controlling every variable and every assignment, but allowing students to understand what they're learning um, as, as they're writing and how they need to respond appropriately and effectively to specific context and writing situations. Okay, thanks, Siobhan. This is Wade Mahon. I'm from UW Stevens Point, and I'll be talking about critical thinking, reading, and writing. Um, critical thinking is one of those terms that we hear a lot, and uh, students are going to encounter it throughout their academic life and syllabi, learning outcomes, everywhere they look. Um, but sometimes it's hard to know exactly what the term means. Um, sometimes we're a little fuzzy on what we mean by it. Often it, it's kind of the rough equivalent of being smart. And uh, so I want us to I want to look at maybe a better. Um, 
or a more specific definition of the term. And the literature on critical thinking usually defines it in terms of cognitive skills and um, things like identifying, analyzing, and evaluating arguments and the logical connections between ideas. So it's a, a way to think logically, analyze things logically in your own writing and, and, your, and things that you're reading. Another thing that, they, that um, the, the literature says is that this is not easy to learn. It's not something that comes naturally to us. We have to learn it. Um, and uh, this is something that I see in students' writing. Um, there are actually several key terms related to critical thinking that, I, that are apparently some of the most obscure words in the English language that I wish students would be more familiar with because I don't see them used very often in their writing. And let me give you a couple of those words. Um, so if you want to take notes, you can write this down. I'll, I'll spell them out if you need me to. Here they are. The first word is because. Um, next one is but. And another one would be and. There are a few others like however and therefore or so. You know, I'm being kind of facetious here, but uh, I really do um, notice that I'm encouraging students to use those words more often um, in their, their writing. It seems like they're reluctant to use terms like that to link ideas. And sometimes I think I misdiagnose that as, um, as a punctuation error, you know, like a, a, a comma splice or a run-on sentence. When in many cases I think it's, when they're leaving those connectors out, it reflects deeper issues related to critical thinking. Um, for instance, if there are two related clauses jammed together, it might not be that they forgot a semicolon or misused the comma. It might be that they just can't articulate the causal or inferential relationships between the two ideas. Um, so the good news is that critical thinking can be learned, and, but it takes practice and attention to do it. Now, one of the most effective tools out there for doing this is what's called argument mapping. And I'll use that term to talk about this in, in the next couple slides. And this kind of goes to what Siobhan was saying about metacognition. This is a, a, a way to develop metacognition in recognizing arguments and, and ideas. And it's probably something a lot of us do already to some degree. It works because it helps us visualize relationships between various claims in an argument. Um, and apparently this helps strengthen our metacognitive awareness of what's going on in, in our, our writing and our thinking. A couple of resources I included on there. Um, we're currently working on this on our campus. We're developing some uh, resources and curricular ideas for how to teach critical thinking. And this, uh, this is a, a website that um, is in progress uh, that might be useful. Another one I put up there is, is from the website called rationale.com, and it's a um, it has some good resources for doing argument mapping. It's one we've been using and, and the, the group we've been, wor been working with. So I want to look at a couple of types of mapping that help us think about critical thinking. Um, one of the uh, um, main kinds of uh, mapping involves uh, focusing on the logical structure of arguments. And there are a couple of approaches out there one of the most common is the Toulmin method. You'll find this in um, textbooks um, quite often. Students might encounter it. Maybe you're already using this in, in your classes. Um, I know that I've, I've used this, this method to help students think about how are their ideas being supported? What are the, what's the main claim that they're making? What's the reasoning behind it? It's a way to put that out there uh, visually. A similar method is the one that I've used that I just started using this semester the, uh, by rationale.com, and it's very similar, but it's, it's also pretty user-friendly in terms of using software to um, um, move ideas around on the screen and uh, seeing how they relate. And I like how you can't, maybe you can't see it very easily there, but I like how they include some of those key specialized terms like because and but and however to help students think about um, the ideas fitting together. Um, but mapping logical structure of an argument can only get you so far. It, can, it can't really tell you how to organize the information into a paper. Uh, it can help you think about whether your argument makes sense, whether it's logical. 
But I think there are other, there's another kind of uh, mapping I want us to think about, and that uh, has to do with using outlines in, in your writing. I think that's a, that's a kind of uh, map, but more of a rhetorical map than a logical map. So this next slide here is a way to think about outlining as a, as a form of critical thinking and, and logical or rhetorical mapping of an idea. And when I talk about this with my classes, I try to encourage them to think about um, strategic outlines versus a topical outline. The topical outline is where you write down what are the topics I'm going to talk about in this paper. You know, I'm going to talk about global warming, I'm going to talk about chronic wasting disease, I'm going to talk about the death penalty. That's probably not going to be a very good paper, especially if you only have five pages to write it in. But uh, being strategic helps you um, focus on what a, uh, a paragraph is doing. I think this is one way to apply what Siobhan was talking about with rhetorical dexterity. Um, and one of the things we're probably all familiar with, one, one of the ways of doing this is the five paragraph essay. That's a strategic outline, a way to map out an argument uh, that works well as an introduction. But one of the things that we see is they're not going to be writing five paragraph essays in college. Um, uh, they might write a, a few, but uh, we need something more that, that enables more dexterity um, with longer and more complex kinds of writing. And one thing, one thing, one of the tools that I like to, to use to build on this is using the classical arrangement structure. That's a similar kind of strategic map um, based on these six different sections in a, in a piece of writing, an argument in particular, um, that could be done in five paragraphs or 50 or 500, depending on how much what you're writing. But it's a way of thinking strategically and, and putting it out on, on paper. Um, and I think this is a good example of a kind of a map. All right, next, next one. I guess to, to wrap up what I was going to say, I think um, these kinds of mapping, critical thinking strategies, um, logical and rhetorical, are helpful for both reading and writing. Um, and because in reading, students need to be able to identify the main idea of what they're reading. This is one of the things that I would like most in my dreams for students to, to, to know when they, they come into my class, or especially when they leave my class. I would like to uh, think that they could read a text and understand the main idea and interpret it um, accurately and, and use the sources accurately and not miss. Uh, misinterpret things. I'm coming across that right now in papers I'm grading this week. Um, but I think actually looking at the rhetorical structure of a text as well as its underlying logical structure is a really helpful way to um, to do that. And starting with the rhetorical structure is um, is a helpful way to get into thinking about the logical structure. So if it's helpful for reading. But I think it's also, of course, helpful for writing as students think, uh, reflect, they reflect and think um, uh, critically on their own writing to see what their ideas are and how they, they fit together. Okay, and that's, that's all I have. That's all you have, okay. Um, hi, this is Karen McClear from UW Platteville, formerly of the UW Colleges. And I wanna talk to you a little bit this afternoon about uh, writing processes. And I struggled with how to design my slide because, as you can see, I have a nice linear list <laughs> of writing processes. Um, but as we know, as Siobhan reminded us, that in order for our students to practice rhetorical dexterity, we have to remember that processes are fluid, that processes um, happen in, in many different forms, and they're certainly not as linear as I've listed them here. But um, I think it's valuable for us as educators, especially with developing writers, to be able to model processes for students. Um, and maybe if they're really being introduced to this for the first time, the steps can be helpful. Um, if you have a developing writer, perhaps you take them through the steps in a particular order, as I've listed them on the slide, starting with invention and working through editing. And once the student is comfortable with something that's linear in fashion and has really mastered the steps, then we can get creative and we can start moving things around a little bit more. Um, 
As educators, we know that process improves product, but I think with student writers, sometimes process is viewed as more work. I have to go through all these steps, and I have to put in more time. Um, and so there's, there's, I think, a natural resistance to that, which, which makes it a little bit more challenging for us. Um, but ultimately, what we're trying to do with students is help them with their skills as a writer, help them sort of build an understanding of how their own writing products can improve um, as a result of putting these processes into practice. And so we have to think about flexibility in the same way that we think about this process as being somewhat linear. Um, and Siobhan reminded us a few minutes ago that every student writes differently. And so one of the things that I would recommend is that at any stage in this process that we are introducing our students to as many possible strategies as we can. Um, with my students in the first semester of college writing, we try on as many invention strategies as we can fit in during the course of the semester. We play around with different planning activities. We draft in different ways, you know, all the way through. And what often happens is I may have a student come up to me and say, well, I don't like this kind of free writing thing. I just, I really liked mapping better. To which I say, okay, once we're through this assignment, the next time you have an assignment, you can do mapping. Um, but I just feel like it's important for the students to have exposure um, to as many, many varieties and, and means of approaching these steps as possible. Um, I use the phrase toolbox on the slide because I think that's really what we're doing. We want the students to have as, as many things in their writing toolbox as possible. Um, you know, Wade gave us some examples of, of mapping and that sort of thing. And maybe a student had never thought about um, using that particular way of organizing their ideas. And so whatever that we can do to help them navigate this writing process is important because they're going to come up with so many different situations in which they're going to be asked to write papers. Um, and out of the things that I have up here in the slide, I guess there's a couple recommendations that I'd want to emphasize here in terms of what we can do for our developing writers. And the first is that I really want to emphasize the importance of having the students clearly understand the assignment, um, the kind of situation in which that they are writing. And this could even be a very simple exercise that I've used with my own students, asking them to rewrite the assignment in their own words. Um, that's a really quick and easy way to see if a student is understanding, for example, that, oh, you're asking them to analyze and not summarize in this particular situation. Um, it's a way of providing a quick check of the student's understanding before the student dives in and commits a lot of time to an essay that maybe turns out to be off mark in terms of the assignment. And so that, that quick intervention can ultimately save the student, going back to their perception, a lot of work down the road um, because their first draft is going to be focused in the right direction. And my second um, point that I want to emphasize again for developing writers has to do with feedback. Um, feedback can come from the instructor, it can come from peers, and I would recommend that feedback comes early in the writing process and often. Um, again, just because it can if, if the student is moving in a direction that's not helpful for what they're trying to communicate, um, you can intervene earlier. And these do not have to be labor intensive or, or anything like that. Um, ask the student, show me your thesis statement. And the student shows you the thesis statement and, you're, oh yes, you're writing for the assignment, keep going, build on that. Or if you're not understanding, then the writer can talk to you about what it is they think their paper is going to do. Um, another example might be, let's take a look at a place in your body paragraph where you're citing a source. And you might be able to very quickly review with that student alternate examples of attribution. So there's a lot of very fast ways that you can provide interventions and feedback before the student has committed to writing a complete draft. I think that's very helpful with developing writers. And in terms of peer feedback, this is one place, again, with developing writers where I would really recommend some prescription, at least early on, in order to be effective. Um, developing writers may lack confidence when it comes to peer feedback. And if there's a lack of confidence, then the student may just read someone's peer draft and say, oh, it's fine, <laughs> which, 
which we know is not helpful for revision. Um, or the other thing that I've seen happen with developing writers is they move right to editing because I know that word is spelled wrong and I can fix that and now I've provided feedback. And, and neither of those is going to help the student writers revision, relook, and, and really try and imagine their paper as something different as part of the revision process. Um, so I would suggest making sure that readers in a peer review situation are directed into some very specific close reading activities in which they are asked to describe what they see in their students' papers. Um, for example, you might ask them to, to describe to the writer what is the main point of the paper that they're reading. And if the writer stated it directly, where they found it. And if the writer didn't state it directly, how did they figure out what it was? Um, and that's not asking either student to be right or wrong. It's just reminding them that writing is communication. And what you're doing is talking about how well that writer's words on the paper are getting the message across. Um, it also encourages a little bit more dialogue. And hopefully the writer will then get the kind of feedback from the peers that either says, oh, I really got my point across, or gosh, this part was confusing, and that gives them some place where they can start the revision process. We want students to understand that they're not writing in a vacuum. A paper needs to be read and understood by an audience, and a peer reviewer even a developing writer can play that role very effectively. So um, my final message about process is as educators, we really want to do everything we can to show students that process has value. Um, if there's no perceived value, if process feels like extra work, students are not likely to use any of the steps in a linear fashion or not unless they're prompted or guided. Um, when students come to college composition, especially in that first semester, it's likely that they will be guided through the process. Um, but once they move into their second semester, that guidance will be diminished. And they are also going to be taking psychology classes and history classes and criminal justice classes in which they are asked to write papers. And they will not be guided through the process in those classes. And so um, I'm kind of like Wade. I have lots of dreams about what we want writers to do. And my dream is that every student writer uses the writing process, even when they're not prompted to do so. And they seek feedback on their own and ultimately produce better writing processes. And so anything we can do to encourage the students to use this process on their own and to recognize the value is good. Okay. And now Virginia. This is Virginia again, and I'm going to um, talk about the last area of the WPA outcomes, the knowledge of conventions. So many students coming into college are anxious about being perceived as good writers. Um, and they may believe that this judgment rests heavily on their ability to write error-free prose. Um, they may have internalized certain rules about correctness. And those rules and ideas about right and wrong may actually be challenged quite a bit when they enter college. The knowledge of conventions is the fourth area of the WPA, WPA outcomes and has been deliberately placed last on the list to reflect that concerns about standard conventions in a text should come later in the writer's process so as not to overshadow their development of rhetorically and critically sound drafts. So what might be new to first year college writers is the idea that conventions are contextual, that what is seen as right or wrong will change depending on the genre, audience, and purpose of the text. They're not a set of commandments set down from a source above, but a set of conventional expectations developed by the readers and writers within any given discourse community. And while the use or misuse of conventions may lead to harsh judgments by some readers, they are in fact meant to be tools that facilitate communication. So I'll talk briefly about conventions of format and structure, of mechanics and grammar, and of source integration and citation. So first, now, uh, conventions of format and structure. So students may come into college with a fairly rigid essay format or structure they're comfortable writing with, or at least familiar with, like the five paragraph essay, or the Mel Kahn paragraph, or the Jane Schaefer paragraph model. Students need to be pre prepared to move beyond these models and understand how genre and audience dictate form and structure. 
students will be asked to write in many different genres throughout college, such as editorials, proposals, lab reports, business reports, research articles, narratives, and most of these genres will require a more sophisticated understanding of expectations for structure, for thesis pl placement, for development of ideas. So students need to understand how to build on the formats and structures they may have learned in high school, and they're likely to do that building by learning how to analyze these new genres. Genre and audience, of course, will also dictate mechanical and grammatical conventions in writing. And students are more likely to find that ideas about correctness are replaced by ideas about appropriateness. Um, like every other aspect of writing, these expectations about grammar and punctuation will be contextual, will depend on what you're writing, to whom, for what purpose, and in what mode. Most of their college teachers will not teach directly about grammar and punctuation, and while they will expect students to be able to produce text that is mostly error-free, most professors will place that far below other criteria when judging student writing. An error-free essay that has a weak argument or lacks development or misses the mark on genre is not going to be a successful essay. And so college writers are best served by postponing their attention to correctness until drafts are nearly ready to be submitted. That said, students should not neglect these conventions. They need to develop good proofreading skills and habits. College writers may also find that they make more errors in grammar and punctuation they did, than they did in high school, and that's a good thing, believe it or not. Because studies show that when writers stretch themselves to try new things, write in new genres or new styles, new sentence structures, they are likely to make more mistakes. So seeing error as a sign of growth rather than a sign of carelessness might help students feel more comfortable taking risks as writers and trying out new things. Also, knowing that stretching yourself may lead to making more mistakes should also help you see how very important that final stage of proofreading is. So the last area of conventions we'd like to touch on are conventions around integrating and citing secondary sources. As with the other conventions, these are highly contextual and determined by genre and academic discipline. Students can expect to use multiple citation styles throughout college, MLA, APA, Chicago, some weird thing the biology department made up <laughs> at UWL, <laughs> et cetera. And they can best adapt to using these various styles if they understand the basic concept of respect for intellectual property and citation as a means of developing credibility as opposed to simply a set of rules and restrictions to be followed. Um, so seeing that, so I don't use an acknowledgement phrase like Martin Luther King Jr. said or put page numbers in parenthetical citations because my teacher said I had to, but because it makes me look like a valid and respectable member of the community of writers and readers. Like conventions of grammar and punctuation, conventions around source use may not be taught directly in, um, in your college classes. Um, but students will be expected to know that secondary sources must be cited. Um, it's likely that first year writing classes will spend some time helping students learn how to summarize and paraphrase secondary sources as well as working on more natural integration of direct quotation into their writing. Um, most first-year students have had some exposure to these skills, but as with many skills in writing, the approach at the college level will probably move the students toward a more sophisticated use of these source integration skills. And that's all I have to say. Okay. So I think we're ready for any questions that we may have, um, that may have come in. So currently, I see that there are no, no questions, so if anybody has any, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Uh, but I'm also going to use this time to remind you that uh, there is an evaluation for all of the webinars, so if you have a chance, please feel free to uh, provide some feedback on, on this webinar. And just a reminder, in two weeks there will be an additional webinar where we'll be joined um, by some folks from admissions offices on various UW campuses. We'll just 
wait for a couple minutes in case any questions come in. You guys were really thorough. <laughs> I found I found myself almost missing advancing the slides a couple times. I was <laughs> so intrigued. Oh. What are some examples of genres of writing products that you wish kids had more exposure to in high school? More argument-driven papers rather than um, personal narratives things that draw less on their opinion and more on their ability to um, deal with other people's ideas in a fair and accurate way. Yeah, I would totally agree. And I'll, I think that could involve argumentative writing and nonfiction right. as well as sure. fictional or even literature is a good way. Writing about literature can be a good way to focus on evidence and supporting claims um, based on what's in a text. That's a good form of, good way to learn textual analysis skills. So, and it, so yeah, being able to write about something outside of themselves and their own personal feelings and experiences is really helpful. Which connects back to what you were talking about with the importance of critical reading. Can they read something and understand what the writer is saying and why the writer is saying that and, and be right. able to articulate that? Mm -hmm. I would say also any genre in which there is a real audience. Yes. So any practice that students can get in writing to an audience other than the teacher. So the teacher is a good audience, but um, it's good for them to have other audiences as well who might actually have a stake in the product. Um, and I think that will help students really understand how how much audience and context informs your choices when you're writing. So I think these could be very small pieces of writing um, that are directed um, at an audience that, that really exists. Uh, before we end the webinar, do any of you have any final comments or thoughts that you want to get out there? Not seeing any. Uh, I just want to, again, I want to thank everybody for joining us for this third College Readiness webinar. And once again, please, uh, if you're, oh, another question came in. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're very welcome. You're On welcome. behalf of of all of the fabulous presenters, you're very welcome. Um, and if you have time, please do fill out the evaluation so we can get some feedback on the webinar. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Are the slides available to us for viewing? Yes, the slides will be posted on the College Readiness website, uh, which I believe was how you went in to register to attend the webinar. I will give it a little bit of time, but we'll post the slides and also the audio from the presentation as well. All right, thank you, everyone.